Okay guys, we are back with the last portion of our online lectures and um, we had discussed so far this these two pathways here called the ATP PC pathway or the phosphagen pathway. Uh, we've talked about anaerobic glycolysis, we talked about aerobic glycolysis, and now we're talking about this aerobic um, pathway, which we also call the oxidative pathway. Um, and this is using primarily fatty acids. So we know that, uh, just a quick review, the ATPPC system uh, is just these basically swimming pools of immediate energy, right? These little baby pools of energy in our muscles that we can use for about 10 to 15 seconds with these two uh, pathways combined. Uh, then we shift into something called anaerobic glycolysis, where we start to use carbohydrates and sugars, which uh, we use as glucose. And this is used without oxygen. These two are used without oxygen. And then we shift into aerobic glycolysis, which again, we're using carbohydrates, but we're using them with oxygen this time, which means that that uh, that glucose is going into the mitochondria and producing a lot more ATP than we get uh, anaerobically. Um, and then lastly, once we've kind of done um, about 30 to 90 seconds of exercise at a lower intensity in this particular pathway, well, then we shift into the aerobic pathway. And you can see that each one of these begins to drop. You can see that the height um, begins to drop. And that means that the power output in each one is much lower. So this one is pretty high. This one is slightly lower. This one here is lower. This one here is lower. And then this one here is really low. And this is referring to power. So this means that the intensity of exercise begins to drop over time as we get into these um, longer, more oxidative pathways. Um, so here we can maintain high intensity for uh, a short amount of time, but we have to take a break and then we can make, get high intensity again. But when we move into this pathway here, it's a much lower intensity. Look how low that is, right? Uh, but this goes from 90 seconds to multiple hours. So let's get into this uh, low intensity, long duration sport or uh, oxidative pathway or aerobic pathway. And this system is sustained for a long period of time. So this is producing energy for a long period of time. Um, and this requires the, the oxidative pathway. Well, what is that? So if we look over here, uh, the gray here would be, we'll just say that this is the muscle cell, right? We see the cell, just follow my pen. And then inside the cell, we have this really big blue mitochondria right here, just follow my pen. And inside the mitochondria, we have a bunch of enzymes that will break down substrates to create products. And we also have the citric acid cycle. You can see that here. And then we will have the production of energy um, in this mitochondria. So we talked about glucose. Let's just focus on this for a second. If exercise intensity is low and longer in duration, glucose will enter the cell and it will get converted into pyruvate. We've seen that, right? And then I told you that this is the metabolic fork in the road. So I'm just going to draw a fork so you get used to seeing that. And pyruvate has to make a decision. If we have high intensity, pyruvate will go this way to lactate, and then lactate and hydrogen, I'm just going to draw an H, will cause burning in the legs, and usually what happens is we have to take a break from exercise. We have to rest and let that lactate dissipate, right? And this anaerobic pathway produces very little energy. But if it's a more low intensity and long duration, well then we'll pull in glucose and we'll convert it to pyruvate, right? And all these enzymes are converting glucose right through here, through this process of glycolysis. They're converting these um, this glucose into pyruvate. Now, pyruvate can also enter the mitochondria, and it's a very complex process in how this works, but we're just gonna say that it can enter the mitochondria and it can produce ATP aerobically, right? So if pyruvate gets into the mitochondria, it will produce a lot of ATP. And whether or not that pyruvate goes this way or this way depends on intensity and duration, right? So somebody that is jogging will use glucose aerobically and pyruvate will go into the mitochondria. Now, fatty acids work the same way. So when we are using fatty acids, 
And that fat can come from the fat that's around our stomach, or it can come from fat that's already inside of the muscle cell. Well, fatty acids do the same thing. So just follow my pen. Don't, don't worry about all this other stuff. Fatty acids will enter the muscle cell. It will enter the mitochondria and then it will undergo processing through the citric acid cycle. So there's all these enzymes right here that will process fatty acids and ultimately the fatty acids will make a lot of ATP, okay? So this would be aerobic energy production and this is using this oxidative pathway. Um, and we use this primarily when we're exercising for several minutes or longer um, and ultimately what glucose and fatty acids are doing is they're creating ATP so that we can continue to exercise for a longer period of time. And this ATP production is going to make a lot of sense very soon. So let's move to the next slide. Um, and this is just a bit more on this system compared to other systems. So let's read this together. So the phosphagen, the glycolytic systems are anaerobic, which means again, there is no oxygen right we're not using oxygen to create that energy and that's why those systems produce very little atp is because they're not using the mitochondria they're not using uh they're not using fatty acids and glucose here and here to create a lot of energy in the mitochondria so without the need for oxygen, they can kick into gear faster than the aerobic system. So that makes sense, right? If we are starting exercise and we're not bringing in enough oxygen to create ATP yet, we need some reserves to use uh, for muscle contraction while we're waiting for the oxygen to kick in and to create higher levels of ATP. Um, and this just kind of says that people like marathon runners will use this oxidative pathway um, if you're running a 5K or if you're exercising longer than 30 minutes. Well, you're using this and this, and they're both going down into the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, they're using oxygen, right? And then they're creating lots of ATP. So I'm just beating a dead horse here so that you understand that, right? Um, now, when sprinters need a lot of energy, they're going to use this system and this anaerobic system, right? Because a sprinter is not low intensity, it's high intensity and it's short duration, right? So the intensity and the duration of the exercise matters. Um, and although the aerobic system isn't fast um, in creating energy, once they get into the aerobic system, they will create a lot more ATP and they can have muscle contraction for a longer period of time, right? And I keep saying that because ultimately I want to get to the main point, which is the ATP that is being produced during exercise. The more of it that we have, right? I'm just going to draw some arrows showing more the longer we can exercise. Now, why is that? Well, why is it that we have to generate ATP in real time to fuel exercise? What does the carbohydrates and the fat and the protein, why do they have to go to the mitochondria to create ATP? What is the need, the, the necessity for ATP? Well, that's going to make sense very, very soon. And this is just kind of a, a, a one more uh, slide to kind of talk about how the mitochondria fuels exercise. And I call this side slide the mitochondria fuel pathway. So as oxygen and nutrients are delivered to the cell, right, specifically in the mitochondria, they are utilized to make ATP. And I told you that ATP is like the currency or the workhorse of the cell, right? So in order to exercise, we need ATP to be made very quickly. And what does that mean? Well, that means all the ADP and all of the AMP that is floating around in the cell as a result of exercise needs to be resynthesized to ATP. And if we don't resynthesize these, we get a lot of AMP we get a low energy state and then we have to stop exercising and it will make sense in a moment. It will make sense why we're doing this. 
Um, and so this energy production is contingent on the creatine uh, system that we talked about, right? Uh, the oxidative system and the glycolytic system, right? So we have all these systems here that kind of contribute to energy production. And let me go back to that. While we're exercising, let me clean this up. While we're exercising, um, all of these pathways are helping resynthesize ATP. Okay, so that's helping resynthesize. That's helping resynthesize. This is helping resynthesize. And this is helping resynthesize. Okay, they're all contributing just at different concentrations or at different levels or at different ratios. They're all contributing to keep ATP high so that the muscles can keep contracting, right? That is their goal. That's what an energy pathway does. Um, and so when we're talking about this oxidative pathway, we're talking about this last system where fatty acids and glucose are making a lot of ATP in the mitochondria. Um, and again, in order to get at that type of energy production, we need low intensity and long duration. Okay, And these are your long duration cyclists. These are your long duration runners. These could be people that are rowing or canoeing. This is exercise that is long term and continuous without any break. And if we go back to this one more time, so let me uh, let me erase some of this here. Let me clean this up. Erase. Um, these would be your high intensity quick twitch sports that require two X activation. These here would be your moderate intensity exercise that re require more of your two A fibers. And then this one here would be your low intensity exercise, which would require more of your type one fibers, right? So each one of your muscle fibers have a preference in what they wanna do and what fuels they wanna burn while doing that. Again, this would be your ATP PC pathway. This would be your sugar glycolysis pathway. And this one would be your fatty acids pathway, right? So each pathway requires a different fuel. Each pathway will preferentially use a different muscle fiber. Um, and when we're talking about the oxidative fiber here, of course, is an analogy. You can read this at your own, uh, your own leisure and just kind of understand how the oxidative pathway is different than these other pathways that we talked about here, right? And if you look at this, this is, again, 90 seconds to hours. So if we're doing low intensity exercise, we can do it for a long time because we're using these really durable type 1 fibers that don't fatigue very easy. We're using fatty acids, right, which provides so much energy and ATP production, and we're doing low intensity. So all of that helps us exercise uh, for longer periods of time. So I, I hope all of that makes sense. And just to kind of bring this all home, oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. When we are um, talking about the fuels we eat, we talk about carbohydrates. Why do we eat carbohydrates? Well, we eat carbohydrates to break them down to glucose. That glucose will get into the blood, right? Um, and that will fuel anaerobic metabolism. But glucose can also fuel aerobic metabolism, and it depends on the intensity and the duration of the exercise. So if we go back here, I just kind of said that, right? So our carbohydrates, C-H-O, primarily work in these pathways. So when you're eating your breads and your pastas um, and your potatoes, right? these carbohydrates are going to anaerobic and aerobic metabolism, right? Now, another place they can go, and we're not gonna to talk too much about that in this class, but if you're going into um, some more complex um, kinesiology courses, we will talk about how these carbohydrates can also go to muscle and to liver glycogen, but we're not gonna talk about that in this class, all right? When we eat our proteins, right, those proteins, will be broken down into amino acids. 
and those amino acids can go to aerobic metabolism, uh, but they don't provide much energy. This is not an energy source, but in the case of fasting or in the case of uh, doing the carnivore diet or doing the um, ketone diet, then we will start producing ATP in the mitochondria. So I'll just write ATP in the mitochondria aerobically, and this will create some ATP. Uh, and then if we're eating fats, right, we're starting to eat, uh, let's just say, a lot of cheese and things like that. Well, those will get broken down into fatty acids, and that will get sent to the mitochondria to produce ATP. So you need to know what glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids are because these are the substrates that the enzymes will break down to make products. And ultimately, those enzymes will break them down so that we can make ATP at the very end. All right, so here is the takeaway for everything that we've been talking about with bioenergetics. And I kept telling you that during exercise, we have to create ATP or we literally cannot have any sort of exercise whatsoever. And hopefully this will make everything clearer and make everything make a bit more sense. So what I wanna familiarize you with before we get into this is this picture here. You see something very familiar, which is the myosin heads right here. And then we can see there is actin here. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because in most of our pictures, the colors were switched. Actin was always blue and myosin was red. But it was different uh, in, in this particular image. And I like this image, so uh, we're gonna use it. And you can see that there are four steps here of how myosin and actin interact to make a cross bridge and to make a power stroke so that muscles can contract. Um, on the right hand side here, let me clean this up. On the right hand side here, I'm sorry, the left hand side here, I have all of the steps. And we're going to go through each of these steps together. And this is the process that ATP is used to make muscle contraction happen. So this is what I was talking about. If we don't have ATP, myosin and actin literally can't interact with one another and they literally can't make cross bridge formations and they can't contract. So the energy that we were talking about from here, right? All of the ATP being produced here, here, and here, and here during exercise, all of that ATP has to go somewhere. And where is it going to go? It's going to go to the myosin head. All right, so this is just telling you all of the steps and I'm gonna walk you through these steps so that we see how ATP is used to make a cross bridge, to make the power stroke, and then to keep recycling that. And they call this the chemomechanical cycle. So myosin's chemomechanical cycle. And what does chemo mean? Chemo means chemical, so that's ATP. Mechanical means the interaction between these two proteins, right? And the pulling of myosin on the actin. And this is a cycle because it's going to keep repeating itself over and over and over again. So you can read this on your own. I guarantee you this will be on your test, okay? And this is something I didn't talk to you about during uh, the structure of skeletal muscle, but I'm talking to you about it now because now we understand what ATP and ADP and AMP are, so we can understand how these things all interact to make muscle contraction. So let's get going with step one. And you can see here I put step one, and then here is telling you what's happening at step one, and I put an arrow, and I have a little GIF here, okay? So in step one, ATP binds to myosin and undergoes hydrolysis. So what is hydrolysis? Well, that just means that one of those phosphates, right? So if I have A for adenosine, and then I have one phosphate, two phosphates, and three phosphates, well, hydrolysis means that this one is cut off. And then if, it's, if it undergoes hydrolysis, what I have then is A, D, P, right, plus one phosphate, 
right? Because I cut it off. It's free now. So in this first stage, ATP binds to myosin, undergoes hydrolysis, um, releasing energy. So here's stage one. And we can see when the muscle is at rest, myosin and actin um, are not interacting, right? We, we know that tropomyosin is there, tropomyosin is protecting um, everything. So when ATP, follow my cursor, binds to the myosin head, it's going to bind right there. The first thing that's going to happen is myosin and actin are going to be released from one another. Okay, so in its rest, in its resting state, let me clean it up here one more time. In its resting state, we know that we have tropomyosin here, right? And myosin and actin are touching one another, but this is in the way, right? So they're not really creating a contraction yet. So what's going to happen is when ATP binds to the myosin head, myosin is going to move down. It's going to create some space and some distance from uh, actin. And you can see that here. So let's watch this GIF here, right? So I see, watch what happens. ATP is going to bind. Here's the ATP. It binds. Now watch, it moves down. Watch that one more time. ATP is going to bind. ATP binds. It moves down. So we can see that once ATP binds, we have the, a the myosin head moving down. Now, the next step that's going to happen is if we look at step two, I put here that ATP hydroly is a hydrolyzed by ATP ACE. This is an enzyme, right? We've kind of talked about this. And you can see that ATP in step two has been converted to ADP and PI, right? So that enzyme ATP ACE has taken the adenosine, it's taken the phosphate, the phosphate, and then the phosphate, and ATPase cut this phosphate, right? So remember like the enzymes, they look like they're, let me see if I can draw this with my right hand. It might look really bad. Um, I said these enzymes are like pairs of scissors, right? Uh, that's not too bad. That looks pretty good. It looks like a pair of scissors. So this ATPase is going to cut this phosphate free. And we can see that right here. We can see that the phosphate has been cut free. Let me erase this here and clean it up. Okay. And what does that do? Well, when that phosphate is cut free, we can see that the myosin head cocks back. And you can see that here, right? So ATP binds. There's ATP. It moves. We have hydrolysis. And look what happens to those heads. So those myosin heads, they cock back backwards. Um, so you can see here it's standing upright. And then here, once that uh, phosphate is cut off, the myosin head cocks backwards. And that makes sense because that's how it's going to create the tension to make the power stroke. So see how right there it cocked backwards. Okay, so let's look at it one more time together. ATP binds, myosin head moves, we go through hydrolysis, the head cocks back. Okay, so that's step two. So step two, I said here, ATP hydrolysis means that one of the PIs, that should be from ATP, was cleaved, and now we have ADP and PI. And what does that do? That takes the myosin head from this way to this way. Oh, let me, let me clean that up. I don't like how I drew that. That takes the myosin head. Let's try it again. We have the myosin head that is standing upright. And then when we hydrolysize that ADP uh, and PI, that head goes like this. It cocks back, right? So the head moves. And let's just watch it one more time. 
Okay. ATP is going to bind. There it is. It's going to release. We get hydrolysis and the head cocks back. Okay. Let me clean this up here. Okay. Um, and you can see that here, right? There's, there's a pretty big difference between this and this. And we call this uh, the basically myosin. Myosin. Cocking. Um, and that's how we're going to initiate the power stroke. Okay, so now something else is going to happen. If we look at step three, the phosphate is going to be released. So we look at step one, an ATP bound to myosin. Myosin created some space, right? It has to create some space because we got to cock the head. The ADP. Uh, the ATP was separated from a phosphate, and that was by the enzyme ATPase, and that caused this myosin head to cock back, right? And what does that mean? Well, that means now this myosin head is in a high energy state, which means it's going to want to, it, it's going to want to do that power stroke. Okay, so then if we move to step three, we can see that the phosphate is release and it allows the myosin to change conformation, initiating the power stroke. So here's step three, the phosphate is released. You see that? And when the phosphate is released, we get a power stroke. So watch this here. So ATP binds, moves, hydrolysis, head cocks back, okay? This one doesn't show it that well, but the phosphate releases and the power stroke occurs. Uh, in this particular video, it's showing both of them together. Um, so that phosphate being released is what causes this movement here. So here, rebinds, and then it pulls, just like that. Okay, so it's showing that ADP and um, phosphate are being released, but that's not really that accurate. So here's the power stroke right there. It's the phosphate by itself that causes the power stroke. And this um, this image here shows it really, really well. Okay. So one more time, let's go through it one more time. And you can kind of watch over here as I'm going through it. ATP binds, step one. What happens on step one once ATP binds? Myosin has to create some space from actin. Okay. Step two. The enzyme ATPase is going to remove one of the phosphates. And then we are left with ADP and PI. And once one of that phosphates are removed, the myosin head cocks, okay? And it moves. And you can see that here, ATP moves, hydrolysis, cocking of the head. You see in this one, the head kind of moves back this way. So watch it one more time. Bind, move, hydrolysis, watch the head cocks this way, okay? Now, in order for the power stroke to occur, we are gonna have the PI be released, and then we're going to have the power stroke occur. So once that cocking happens right there, myosin is going to interact with actin once again. And you can see that here, right? So let me clean it up. Um, right here. Okay. So once we have that hydrolysis, look at this. Okay. The head cocks. Do. And let's go down here. And then we have this rebinding of myosin to actin. Okay. And notice that the color is different here. The color is different because that means that this is now a high energy myosin head. It's ready to create the power stroke. All right. So let's go through it one more time. Let's just beat a dead horse. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm purposely trying to add new detail every time I go through it so that it's not so overwhelming. Okay. ATP binds to the myosin head. Myosin head gets some space from actin. We undergo hydrolysis, which means that enzyme ATPase is going to cut off one of the phosphates. That's going to cock the head back, 
and then it's going to rebind to myosin. Okay. So now once it rebinds, in order for the power stroke to occur, the phosphate has to be released and then the power stroke happens. Myosin will start pulling actin and then those Z bands of the sarcomere will get closer to one another. And this is pretty accurate except for it's holding on to the ADP. Um, in step four here, let's go to step four. In step four here, we are left with ADP still being bound to myosin. So ADP needs to be released so that a new ATP could come back in. All right. If ADP is not kicked out, we can't have this cycle continue to happen over and over and over again. Now, here is something really interesting that um, I hope will help you understand this. When we have ATP being produced in the mitochondria, right? Mitochondria spitting out ATP all the time, right? And when we start exercising and we start recruiting all of those nutrients, right? What nutrients? Carbohydrates, right? And fats. And those carbohydrates and those fats get into the muscle cell and the enzymes start to break them down and they go into the mitochondria with oxygen. Well, that's going to produce a ton of ATP. And where is that ATP going? It's going to the contracting muscles, right? So that's where this energy is coming from. And you can see that the more we contract, the more energy is needed in these myosin heads because they're going to kick out ATP. They're going to create ADP and then they need another series of ATPs to keep this contracting happening, right? And that's why we call this the chemomechanical cycle uh, because it must happen over and over and again. If we no longer have ADP, because we run out of these substrates, right? We're not eating the right way. Well, then the muscle gets filled with a DP and a MP. So if we think about this like scientists, if I don't have any ATP and all I have left is ADP, well, let's look at this here we see that ADP keeps myosin bound to actin. We can't have any contractions if we're not making any more ATP. So this will stop muscle contraction, which will stop exercise. Now, let's think about this from another perspective. If we have someone that has perished and they have died, and they no longer are producing ATP because if you're not breathing, that oxygen is not going to the mitochondria. And if no oxygen is going to the mitochondria, we're not producing any more ATP. So then what happens? Well, if we only have ADP or we don't have any more ATP being produced, then we're stuck in this position. And I said this in class, I said that this position is where myosin and actin are locked together and we have no movement. And this is something that the human body undergoes when we perish called rigor mortis. And if the body gets stiff and we um, are, the body is experiencing rigor mortis, well, that's because there's no more ATP to release myosin from actin, which means no more of this cycle can happen because no more ATP is being produced. So I hope that makes, uh, I hope that makes sense. So, um, essentially these are the four steps. Let me go through them one more time just so that we understand everything. Um, and this is kind of showing what's going on here, but there's a slight discrepancy between this and this. So one more time again, the mitochondria, right? So let me go back here. Let's put it all together. We start exercising and all of these energy systems are producing ATP right? To, at some level, right? Some are producing them anaerobically. Some are producing them aerobically. Some are producing a lot more than others, right? They're all producing ATP. And this is what metabolism is during exercise. And we know that that ATP is going 
to the skeletal muscle that absolutely must have it. Because if we don't have the ATP, we don't have any more contraction. And this is what fatigue feels like. When you feel muscle fatigue, it's because we don't have any more of the energy to fuel the contraction. So let's go through it one more time and just make sure that we understand each of these steps. Um, and let me go back to this slide. Okay, here we go. So in step one, uh, let me clear this here. Okay, in step one, okay, so we'll start here. Before ATP, before new ATP comes, myosin and actin are bound together. Once a new ATP arrives in step one, myosin can release from um, actin and it moves down, it creates space. And you see that here, right here. New ATP comes in, right here. Myosin moves down and creates space, okay? Let's go to the second step. In the second step, we have ATP hydrolysis by ATPase, the enzyme, and this cox the myosin head back, okay? So let's see if that's true. Here's step two. We have the separation of a phosphate from ADP. We can see that myosin has moved, right? This myosin is very different than this myosin, so we have cocked back, and it's going to rebind to uh, myosin and actin are, gonna, are going to rebind, and we can see that here. So here's the hydrolysis, cocking back, rebind. Okay, let's look at it one more time. ATP, cock, move back, hydrolysis, the heads are gonna cock, we're gonna rebind trying to keep up with that animation, okay? Uh, let me clean this off here, all right? So now moving to step three, we um, can see that the cross bridge has been reformed. We can see that the myosin heads are in a high energy state, meaning that they're ready to pull on uh, myosin and before they can pull, they have to release that phosphate. And once that phosphate is released, then we have the myosin pulling, actin, um, and then we have the power stroke that occurs, right? Um, and after that power stroke, and if we look here, right, we can see that pulling, right? So the ATP binds, move, hydrolysis, cocking, release of the phosphate, and we have the pulling. Uh, again, that image is not accurate because as you can see, ADP is still bound. We can't have ADP uh, be released. And then um, eventually we have to create space for a new ATP molecule so that ADP will be released. But again, it is independent of the phosphate. They're not released together like this. And then that entire cycle happens all over again. So uh, your number four, the thing to know for number four is that ADP will be kicked out so that we can start that cycle again for uh, with ATP. Okay, now to summarize all of this and bring this all together um, for a conclusion, I want you to think about the following things. Um, so we intentionally uh, feed ourselves, uh, especially if we're an athlete, with carbohydrates, proteins, and fats for the reason of creating substrates that our body can use for energy. What are those substrates? Well, they're glucose, amino acids, which really don't make a lot of energy, and fatty acids, right? These come from the foods. And during exercise, we will use these substrates either anaerobically or aerobically to create ATP. And we know that that ATP is going to go directly to skeletal muscle to help it contract. Now, we talked a lot about th these energy systems. We talked about the ATP PC system. We talked about the anaerobic and aerobic glycolysis system. And then we talked about the oxidative system, right? And these systems use different substrates, right? We know that glucose is being used here. And we know that fat is being used here. 
And depending on the intensity or the duration of exercise, we will use these systems within different ratios. And what are these systems doing? Well, we know that the muscle and the actin and myosin are contracting and they require ATP. Well, we know that the creatine phosphate system will take ADP. Where is that ADP coming from? Well, if we look back here, that ADP is coming from the muscle that is spitting it out. That's why we talked about this. And that ADP is floating around. And we need new ATP to bind to the myosin to help contraction continue. So we know that there's a lot of ADP floating around because the muscle is spitting out ADP once it has used the energy from it. So we know that the creatine phosphate system can take ADP and create ATP for those contracting muscles. We know that glucose can come into the skeletal muscle. It can go to the mitochondria to create more ATP for the skeletal muscle. And we know that fatty acid can do the same thing. It can go into the mitochondria to create ATP. And all of that ATP collectively is going back to, let's just go like this, back to the skeletal muscle to help it contract during exercise. And that's how these things are all working together. And that is bioenergetics.